Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Dinardis, and on behalf of my co-editors, Derek Cogburn, Nanette Levinson, and Fra Francesca Musiani, and of course, on behalf of the Internet Governance Lab at American University, I want to thank you sincerely for joining us for the launch of our latest book collaboration called Researching Internet Governance, Methods, Frameworks, Futures. This book began over a casual lunch discussion at a table in Istanbul, Tur Turkey, where uh, many of us were attending the Internet Governance Forum uh, held by the United Nations and also attending a workshop of the Global Internet Governance Academic Network, which we all belong to. This was back in 2017, so it's a project that we've been working on for quite a while. And there was rising attention at the time to internet governance uh, controversies and rising interest in how to study this critical area. So over lunch, we decided to embark on this project and try to put together a book with the intention of bringing together internationally acclaimed authors and scholars to write from various disciplinary perspectives. So in, first of all, an enormous thank you to these authors, many of um, whom you will see here, for joining us. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. It's been um, a three-year process. Uh, this book is available open access. I hope that uh, those watching are already aware of this. We wanted to have it available for as many students and others uh, to read as possible. I wanna thank the Hewlett Foundation and um, their cyber initiative and especially Eli Sugarman who funded the open access launch of this book, uh, the process of open access and also funded the workshop uh, where we brought international scholars from around the world to uh, discuss this project and to present and uh, basically peer review each other's work. It was really a lot of fun. Um, we're thrilled uh, that the book is published by the MIT Press, uh, which I've had the priv privilege of working with in the past. And this one appears in the new Innovative Information Policy Series that is edited by Sandra Brayman. Thank you, Sandra, for um, hosting our, this book. I wanna thank, um, since I'm here in DC and uh, since I'm a member of the local uh, chapter of the um, Internet Society, I wanna thank the local chapter and uh, Dustin Loop for co-hosting this and helping to publicize it and doing the live streaming. Thank you very much to the DC chapter of the Internet Society. Thanks um, to my colleagues, Ken Merrill and Matt Seklecki for doing a lot of the work organizing this. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without them. And finally, on a personal personal note, um, I, I would be remiss to not express um, just what a pleasure it is to collaborate. This is not the first collaboration with my friends, Derek, Nanette, and Francesca. Um, I collaborate with them on a daily basis, including our books. Um, and um, we see each other more in other countries than we do in the United States, which is funny since we all are, are co-located most of the time, but um, I'm already looking forward to our next collaboration. So with that, I wanna turn it over. I'm very pleased to turn it over to our distinguished moderator, Henriette Esterhuizen. She's an extremely prominent fi figure in internet governance who needs no introduction, but she is currently the chair of the United Nations Global Internet Governance Forum's Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. I didn't use any acronyms, so you can thank me later. And uh, she, of course, is uh, known for many other things, including serving for a very long time as the Executive Director of the Association for Progressive Communications. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Henriette, for moderating it, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much um, for that introduction, Laura. And I think it's a very nice open access touch to have a non-academic moderate the book launch. And it's really good to know that this book started at an IGF. So just to tell everyone a bit about the format, um, we are going to break the authors up into different groups, different thematic groups that mirror the structure of the book. And I'll introduce the speakers before every segment, every, every um, separate um, bit of the structure. They're, they'll each have three minutes and everyone will see the timer. So this is a very democratic disciplinary process um, to keep everyone to their time. If they go over time, I'll make hand signals. Um, and then we'll have, um, after all the inputs from the speakers, we'll, we'll have a, a Q&A. And during that Q&A, please, everyone, you're encouraged, start using the Q&A function of Zoom to record your questions as you hear the authors speak. 
and we'll try to get as, uh, to as many of those as we can. If we don't, um, we do look forward to answering any further relevant questions that we couldn't get to in a blog post that will follow the book launch and it will be on the Intergovernance Inter Labs website. And the team will be um, um, posting relevant links. So keep an eye on the chat um, because links to the book, to the open access version and to where you can continue the discussion will be posted. So um, without any um, further ado, let me start with the first group. Um, the first group of authors um, are Laura, Sandra and Milton. And I'll just tell you briefly who they are. There are four bios available and you can follow the link. And um, Laura is a globally recognized internet governance scholar and professor and associate dean in the School of Communication at American University. Sandra Brahman is professor of communication and John Paul Abbott professor of liberal, liberal arts at Texas A&M University and edits the information policy book series for MIT Press. Milton Mueller is an internationally prominent scholar specializing in the political economy of information and communications. So Laura, Sandra and Milton, um, really, and this is relevant to me as a non-scholar and I, I think to many of our participants, what is internet governance and what is internet governance research and why do you think it's important? Laura, why don't you go first? Thank you very much. Um, I'll talk about why I study internet governance because every societal issue of any importance is mediated by control struggles over the digital world. Whether this is governance uh, by technical design, governance by private companies, uh, governance by new global institutions such as standard setting and ICANN, or governance in the traditional sense of uh, laws and policy making. Just think about the present moment um, and the pandemic. How should we be dealing with health disinformation online? Um, how can we secure the digital public sphere from election interference? How can we have uh, the necessary cyber, cyber security approaches to, um, to protect telemedicine devices and remote medical monitoring while people are socially isolated? And how can we provide access to people who don't have access, who need this right now during the pandemic to study or to work? Um, how can the, and this is um, something I, my last book addressed, how can the internet of things be potentially exploited to, for good, but also for things like disrupting the coming presidential election? Um, all of these are internet governance questions. They involve digital infrastructure and they involve power. The thesis of all of my work as an internet governance scholar, and I know many of my colleagues here share this view, is that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power. In my book, Protocol Politics, I studied um, the, pol the politics of protocols in the global war for internet governance. I studied the politics of digital infrastructure. In my most recent book, uh, The Internet and Everything, I studied the governance and the politics around the internet of things. So I think, you know, to me, this uh, issue of power around digital infrastructure is incredibly important. Digital infrastructure is now a, and control of it is a proxy for political power. That's why the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Russians are highly interested in controlling infrastructure. So that's why I study it. Um, we wanted to write this book because it's kind of challenging to study. Um, the, both the internet as a term, governance as a term, these are malleable uh, phrases that whose meanings are always in flux. You have to make the invisible infrastructure visible. Um, it requires understanding complex technologies. Um, it, there's a challenge in studying the private sector that is, is often protected by trade secrecy. And it involves navigating competing values such as things like national security interests versus individual civil liberties. Um, and as a final point, uh, we have a lot of students um, who I saw signed up, um, just to say that research in this area is, and this is why I like it, it's policy engaged or policy engaged or uh, policy in adjacent. So if you wanna have real world impact on problems, um, this is a fun area to study. So I study this because internet governance and especially cybersecurity, um, these are the great human rights issues of our time. Thanks, thanks, Laura. Sandra. Uh, 
Sandra, are you there? Sorry, Sandra, I'm about to introduce you. I just need to get my screen up. Sorry, Sandra, I forgot to add um, your, your, I forgot to go into your bio. Sandra Brahman is a professor. No, I did introduce all the speakers. Yeah. I did introduce all three of you. So sorry, go ahead. But now I'm unmuted, um, which has an advantage. I'll give you your time back. Thank you. Uh, even though reality may not exist, we have a right to it. That was a poem written in 1974. Internet governance is a subset of information policy, very broadly defined laws and regulations for any form of information creation, processing, flows, and use, whether public or private. And thus it's parametric policy, meaning it affects the um, it affects informational, social, and technological systems. For each system, it affects the identity, structure, borders, and change processes. That makes internet governance a matter of meta-governance as well as governance, and that raises meta-questions for researchers. Using the broadest of possible approaches to defining internet governance, my chapter in this book introduces such questions as they arise theoretically, conceptually, and methodologically. Let me offer a few examples. What is the internet? Uh, we're in uh, talk two and it's come up twice. We are far past the point at which we can think of it as a communication network distinguishable from other matters such as agriculture or defense for governance purposes. How does internet governance engage with the affordances offered by the structures and processes of geopolitically defined entities, states, and international organizations? And how do such meta governance processes in turn transform geopolitical governance and international organizations? The First Amendment distinguishes among five types of information processing. But there are, of course, many, many more types in US constitutional law. I've located dozens already. How should we distinguish among types of information processing for differential legal and policy treatment, for differential governments, whether that's by public or private sector entities? Is the internet meaningfully and effectively governable, governable at all? Political scientist Bob Jessup points out that all governance fails. Irony is one of the three ways he identifies that those who govern keep going in the face of this knowledge. The irony of internet governance research is that in many ways, the subject is either more than that or it may not exist at all. Still, it is to our advantage to act as if it does if we want to protect our human rights and civil liberties. The policy punctuation of the digital shock during the pandemic, which forced almost all social processes online, makes us more important than ever before. 74, the year of that poem, was the year we were talking about New World Information Order, turbulence, hyper-reality, and the internet protocol was introduced. Even though reality may not exist, we have a right to it. Thanks very much, um, Sandra, for that. Milton, what is your take on this question? Yes, first I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Farzan Abadi, who uh, helped write this chapter, and I saw her pop up. Um, uh, so presumably she's here, but uh, I'm not going to share any of my time with her because uh, I don't have enough. So um, uh, we discuss internet governance as a word and as a topic or field of study and as a real world political process. And our chapter traces the way all three of those meanings interact with each other from roughly 1994 to the present day. So we show that the term got cemented into place, internet governance, uh, with battles over the formation of ICANN, and then became fully recognized as a broader domain of global governance during the World Summit on the Information Society. And after that, continue to elevate in importance until it became central to geopolitical power debates. So internet governance research now overlaps with studies of war and interstate conflict, deterrence, foreign policy, espionage, privacy, terrorist groups, threats to critical infrastructure, not to mention the merging of the cyber and the physical in the so-called internet of things or industrial internet. So to many people, internet governance sounds like a very obscure term, and it is indeed a mouthful. 
you're more likely now to hear about platform governance or data governance or algorithmic regulation or cybersecurity. But all of those new catchphrases are reactions to the global cyberspace created by the universal compatibility of the internet protocols. Now you can't govern everything in society by governing the internet. That would be uh, uh, an absurd kind of overreach. But all of these problems I just mentioned are derivatives of internet governance problems. The real question is, does internet governance have a future? Does information technology so permeate our lives that everything and nothing is internet governance? I think you get your answer by looking at the headlines of the past two weeks. We have unprecedented bans on apps and services as the US imitates China's great firewall. From the very beginning, internet governance was fascinating because of the mismatch between global cyberspace and the territorial boundaries of nation states. That problematique has not gone away, it has intensified. So how we govern the internet, the movement of data, the ownership and control of communication is going to play a big role in how we govern everything and in the very nature of governance. Thanks very much, um, Milton. It really does always strike me how this broad definition of internet governance has, has um, been sustained. And it was actually quite contested when, when it was first developed or the broad approach to internet governance in 2005. And your inputs really affirm the need for a broad approach. And our next speakers are Francesca, Rolf, Wendy and Eric. I'll introduce them briefly. Dr. Francesca Musiani, uh, Socioeconomics of Innovation. Um, she's at Mines Paris Tech, an Associate Research Professor at the French National Center for Scientific Research. Rolf Weber is Professor for Civil, Commercial and European Law at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He's also a visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong in China. Dame Wendy Hall, and I hope Wendy is with us now, and she was still joining earlier, is Regius Professor of Computer Science, Associate Vice President, and uh, also Executive Director of the Web Science Institute at the University of Southampton. And Eric Jardine, the final speaker in the segment from the Center for International Governance and Innovation, is a fellow there and assistant professor of political science at Virginia Tech. So um, Francesca, Rolf, Wendy and Eric, you approached um, your, your um, contributions all from very different disciplines and you, you look at internet governance research from these different disciplinary perspectives. What insights do you think can be gained or have you gained from looking at internet governance research through those uh, different disciplinary perspectives. So let's start with Francesca and just say a little bit about the disciplinary perspective you come from and then the insights that that, that has given you. Francesca first. Thank you very much, uh, Henriette. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, so uh, my chapter in, in this book uh, is about how to approach the study of internet governance with uh, uh, methods and concepts that are drawn from the field of science and technology studies. So uh, these approaches have proved uh, useful for a few years, but I would argue uh, in recent years, uh, even most, uh, to examine internet governance as a, a set of processes uh, that are both uh, continuous, ongoing, uh, and uh, very contested. So this understanding uh, of governance uh, helps paying attention to uh, a dimension that has perhaps been a bit overlooked in the early days uh, of the field. Uh, that is to say, the mundane practices of all those that are involved in providing, maintaining, caring for the network, or hacking or resisting it, uh, developing and testing, or simply using the network of networks in some instances. And uh, um, so this understanding of governance helps uh, um, considering these mundane practices as a part of uh, the governance in internet governance. Uh, in this chapter in particular, I look at two things, uh, social technical controversies and their sociology and uh, the politics of infrastructures. Um, since the very early days of the internet, 
the fact of being on and managing uh, the network of networks has been about exercising controls over particular functions of it uh, that provide specific actors with both power and opportunity to act to their advantage. And uh, on the other hand, there is very rarely but a single way to implement a particular function or but a single actor capable of controlling them. So as a consequence, the internet is very controversial and contested, increasingly so, uh, as much as it becomes uh, an increasingly pervasive uh, uh, entity in our lives. Uh, both target and instrument of governance and uh, uh, object of interest uh, of a myriad of actors uh, from the most powerful and centralized to the average internet user. And internet infrastructures in particular can be understood as a fundamental place, as Laura has said, to exercise economic, social and political power. And the STS approaches seek to expose this manifestation of power that are often implicit uh, and overlooked. Uh, what I mentioned in the chapter as the first and foremost insight that in my view should be taken from it is that when examined through the STS lens, the internet is not a given and static technological entity that is in need of regulation as it has too often been treated in the past, but it is a dynamic, contested and evolving set of entities that include both human and technical elements, all contributing to constitute the social political order of the internet of today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Francesca. Rolf. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Oriette. And uh, of course, also thank you to the four co-editors having done a great job. Obviously, as we are aware of, the emphatic pronouncement of the late John Perry Bello about the independence of cyberspace and the chance of netizens not to care about governments anymore turned out to be unrealistic. The dichotomy between the global reach of the internet and the mainly national embedment of the normative rules, and that's my legal lens, needs uh, to strengthen the interdisciplinary research. New concepts and methods must enshrine issues such as legitimacy, quality of regulation, technical standardization, transparency, and accountability. Furthermore, from a policy-oriented perspective, the traditional understanding of political structures as command by a specific body that induces people to execute certain actions have at least partly been replaced by a more inclusive multi-stakeholder approach, again, an interdisciplinary perspective in the internet governance context. The manifold challenges having occurred during the last 20 years require the cooperation, not only between different disciplines, but geographically also between the continents. If a legal lens is applied, as in my article, then it appears to be obvious that the original soft law in the IT context has become much harder over the last years. Therefore, since normative uh, principles like criteria for regulation need higher attention, the awareness of uh, individual stakeholders in broadening the foundation for policy decisions must equally grow. Reality also shows that sovereignty considerations causing legal fragmentation, jeopardizing cross-border data flows, and leading to power struggles are substantial risks for the realization of a global peaceful network and this fragmentation must be overcome. The new developments challenge the legal profession, I have to admit it. Only interdisciplinary research will be able to widen the perspective for an overarching perception of internet governance in all social sciences, following resource social contract concept, open communication channels should be established and implement commons of knowledge, future-oriented policies must combine the legal, socio-economic, political, and ethical dilemmas. Thanks, thanks very much, Rolf. And thanks to you and everyone else so far for being so disciplined with time. Um, Wendy, what is your perspective on this? Uh, hi, um, can you hear me all? We hear you very clearly, go ahead. Amriette, remember this? Yes! <laughs> he gave us you the were very 
surprise me with that. <laughs> it's lovely to see so many old friends and people I met through the whole uh, Internet Governance Commission journey and others. Um, so our, our book, I must pay thank uh, Kieran O'Hara, who couldn't be here today in the end, and Asta Madden, who was our postdoc and now works with Arup. For, uh, it, was a, it was a jointly put together paper reflecting the work we were doing on the Webb Observatory, uh, which we called an observatory after the physicists who observed the stars. And we were trying to observe what people were doing on the web, which of course would translate to what people are doing on the internet. So we were looking for an evidence-based approach. And the problem with that always is that once you start observing something, people change their behavior. But that was where we were, when we were writing this chapter, that was where we were putting our uh, efforts into trying to build metadata catalogs to help people understand, share research data sets about social machines, uh, activities on the web or the internet, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that work morphed into uh, something I got involved, I co-authored the UK government's AI review in 2017. And in that, we picked up a lot on this concept of um, the idea of data trusts, where you have set up a legal and ethical framework for exchanging and sharing data. And this is now expanding very fast all around the research world in terms of helping people share data sets, share big data sets to help them find the evidence they need for their research, whether it's in health data, social science data, or um, data about internet governance. And that, um, uh, you know, we're really looking here at metadata catalogs. We're not looking at actually transferring large data sets. We're looking at how you query or do federated queries across data sets to get answers to bigger questions. And that morphed into Kieran and I thinking more about how the internet is, it's the internet, internet governance is so related to data governance. And we have um, actually start, uh, worked and we've written a book now about what we call four internets, which is showing how the internet is fragmenting along geopolitical lines, aligned with the way countries uh, manage data. Uh, we have an open internet, we have a market force led internet in the US, we have a data protection led internet in Europe, and we have a surveillance or paternal or whatever type of internet in China, and then we have other actors around the world and that book comes out next year. So uh, that's where we've gone with this work and I'm just excited we have a chapter as part of this book about evidence-based work in internet governance. Thanks, Wendy. And by the way, that uh, problem you just outlined will be the topic of a main session at this year's IGF, really? which you'll be hearing about more later later on. Not today, but we'll share information. <laughs> so finally, in this segment, Eric, what, what is your perspective? Hi, uh, thanks, everybody. And my thanks to all the editors for convening and hosting me. Um, I have basically four points uh, to make about my disciplinary background, where I come from, how it kind of informed what I do, and what is in my particular chapter. Uh, so I have sort of a political science slash policy background. So that training over the course of my PhD and everything else kind of taught me to think in causal terms and to look at, with, at everything with an eye towards policy interventions. And gradually, as, this, as time sort of wore on and I got more and more exposed to cybersecurity related uh, issues, I began to realize that good causal theories and good policy interventions all require some sort of uh, firm foundation at a descriptive level. Right? You need to know what's going on before you can articulate explanations of various and variance in a causal sense or intervene in a policy sense. And so that got me thinking about what I would characterize as sort of the big uh, descriptive claim that might be uh, batted about with regards to internet governance and cybersecurity, which is this idea that cybersecurity is definitively beyond bore getting worse over time. Uh, I think there's certainly a lot of potential that that claim is correct, but then what started to unfurl in my mind was the notion of at the metrics and measurement level, there is reason to suspect that this claim may in fact be descriptively inaccurate. Mm. And so that's what I tried to really take issue with in my particular chapter, which I called uh, taking the growth of the internet seriously when measuring cybersecurity. And there are basically two ways that I propose in this chapter, along with dealing with a, a series of sort of subsidiary points uh, in which internet governance 
uh, sorry, cybersecurity measurement may in fact be incorrect. I'll give you one example because I think it's the most sort of evocative and illustrative. So the anti-phishing working group routinely publishes quarterly reports detailing their documented trend in phishing websites, websites designed to infect machines. If you look at the overtime trend in the count of websites that they're recording from 2008 to 2015, where I had data, it was 164% increase. That certainly fits with that narrative, that descriptive narrative that things are worsening over time. I found some rough measures for uh, the number of websites that are out there. And if you normalize those statistics to sort of convert the count into a rate, which is a, just a measurement change, you actually end up with a reduction in risk of 47%. So a 211 percentage point gap between the two. So I detail other measurement procedures that actually change the measures we use and fundamentally produce a different descriptive narrative as a result. One that essentially suggests from a sort of policy perspective that things might not be as bad as they appear, which has a series of knock-on effects about resource allocation and investment. So that is almost exactly on time. Perfect, look at that. Thank you. Thanks, and I hope there are policy makers um, at the launch who, who will be inspired to look at evidence by, by, by your and others' input. And next, we're going to, to um, listen to Ricky, Derek, Nielsen, Ron. I'll introduce them briefly. Um, Ricky Frank Jurgensen is a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for Human Rights in Copenhagen. Um, Dr. Derek Coburn is professor in the International Communication and International Development Programs at the School of International Service and the Information Technology and Analytics Department in the Kogot School of Business at American University. Neil Steinhofer is a PhD candidate with the Data Active Research Group at the Media Studies and Political Science Department at the University of Amsterdam. And last but not least, uh, Ron Diebert is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, University of Toronto. Your question is, it's, it feels a little bit like I'm on a, on a game show, but I'm not. <laughs> um, what are some of the methodological, methodological challenges um, that you've encountered, in particular the proliferation of massive amounts of data or challenges that are that are posed as a result of the massive amounts of data. Ricky, can you start us, please? Yes, well, thank you, Henriette, and uh, hi, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. So in my chapter, I address uh, tech giants as the subject of research based on experiences from interviewing staff at Google and Facebook. In this research, I was really interested in learning um, about the platform sense making around human rights as it relates to massive data collection and data use and to governance of, of user expression and assemblies. So in order to, to capture the respondents, the staff sense-making around human rights, I looked for common frames used to describe this relationship uh, between platform practices and the international human rights system. And I focused on the language and the metaphors used to to talk about specific issues in relation to human rights. <clears throat> so for example, all my respondents would emphasize privacy as an important norm, but I realized from their examples and the stories that they told me that they referred to a very specific understanding of privacy. So I had to go through several questions asking more explicitly what privacy protection at Google and fake Facebook entailed. And I found that it refers solely to user empowerment and user control with metaphors such as users must know how to drive the car and not to limits on data collection and processing, which is core to privacy and data protection rights. So I then analyzed this sense making from the perspective of power and institutional interest. And I found that various reference to privacy as limits on data processing would challenge the underlying business model of the platforms. The framing of privacy as user control may be accommodated through various user options and settings without questioning what was going on behind the scene. So in that sense, it's a much less controversial framing seen from the perspective of the business model. It basically allows for a company discourse around privacy to continue without ever disrupting the data processing. Uh, also, there was a strong narrative around human rights threats posed by governments and the role played by the companies in protecting these rights against uh, such violations. 
In other words, aligning company and user interest against a third party, the state. Again, this is a convenient framing because it allows for highlighting all kinds of due processes and safeguards within the companies without engaging with the human rights impact of the company on its own accord. A final observation from the chapter concerns the role of tech giants vis-a-vis -vis states in defining the human rights agenda. In the internet governance domain, where there is close public-private engagement and collaboration on several public policy issues, and where the tech giants increasingly are asked to assist the state, for example, in relation to illegal content, I find it crucial to critically examine the interest vested in a particular framing of right and to insist on structures of accountability and rule of law in the governance of human rights. Also, one should clearly distinguish between the legally binding human rights obligations of states and the soft law responsibilities of companies stipulated in the UN guiding principles. So that was just a bit of uh, a few points uh, from my chapter. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ricky. Uh, Derek. Thank you so much, uh, Henriette. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we see from my perspective, uh, focusing particularly on text mining. Um, and I'd like to talk about both the challenges as Henriette has posed it, but also the opportunities. So one of the opportunities is that we see a tremendous growth in digital data that is uh, relevant for internet governance research. So whether we're talking about meeting transcripts, published reports, legal documents, uh, email archives, uh, RFCs, um, uh, various kinds of text-based uh, documents and data that are available for internet governance researchers. And this is accelerated by the um, additional uh, opportunities for storage, um, where we can store large amounts of data, but also um, software tools, um, both open source and uh, commercial software tools that let us analyze these large-scale text-based data sets. So, on the open source side, for example, we program in R uh, using R Studio, and also on the commercial side, we use tools such as the Probalis uh, Pro Suite, which is easier uh, to use. With these tools, we can take both exploratory approaches and confirmatory approaches. So we can take large amounts of data and go into these um, data sets to explore what's there. Um, what are some of the key topics that are there? What are some of the trends and themes? What are some of the named entities um, that come out of that uh, tool? And what are some of the clusters uh, that uh, form within these data sets? But we can also take confirmatory approaches where we can go into a data set looking to see if something that we're interested in is there or not. And in this chapter, we take both those uh, exploratory approaches as well as the confirmatory approaches and apply it to looking at the Internet Governance Forum. So going back to the beginning um, in Athens, the Internet Go Governance Forum has made transcripts of all of its main sessions and many of its workshops um, as well. And those transcripts have all been made uh, available to the public. So that creates an opportunity for a text miner to be able to see, can we exploit that text from both um, an exploratory perspective and um, a confirmatory perspective. So in the chapter, we go through and we look at all of those uh, techniques to find topics and to find trends and, and themes over time because we've got 12 years of data now we've got 15 years of data uh, and look at topics and how they change uh, over time but we can also be confirmatory so what I do in the chapter is I build a categorization model or a dictionary um, that looks at the NIST cybersecurity framework and I wanted to assess the degree to which that framework was present or absent in the IGF uh, transcripts so we applied that and looked over time, and there was a correlation between when the NIST framework was introduced and when those mm -hmm. kinds of topics uh, emerged. So it was a great uh, test of these approaches. Thank you, Henriette. Thanks, Derek, and I look forward to, to reading that. Um, next, we have Niels. Niels, welcome. Thanks so much. I'm privileged, honored, and humbled to be among such great scholars and actors in internet governance, both in the book, the meeting, and on this panel. The mailing list, as Derek just said, have been an inherent part of the development of the internet infrastructure, yet they are somehow understudied in the study of the governance of the internet infrastructure. Mailing lists could even be understood as an inherent part of the internet infrastructure, as well as a tool for developing it. 
public mailing lists are also often used as a legitimizing aspect of internet governance because everyone can partake in discussion and policy making through them and people can review and analyze these mailing lists. And that is exactly what I and my co-authors, Stefania Milan and Davide Beraldo, the Data Active Research Group at the University of Amsterdam, have been doing. By operationalizing a statistical analysis, discourse analysis, and network analysis on internet governance mailing lists in the IETF, ICANN, and RIPE through an open source Python-based tool called Big Bang, uh, we analyze decision-making in internet governance. Now, mailing list analysis can show how concepts are introduced, emerge and develop, and how they travel through working groups and communities, and even between different governance bodies, and who are the key actors in transmitting them or actually in blocking them. Such analyses show sites of contestation and allows for the analysis of how decision-making really takes place and how technology and cultures take shape, as well as trends in participation and corporate affiliation and gender diversity. So now that the internet infrastructure has become the backbone of the information society, it is more important than ever to study patterns of power and control in the governance of the internet infrastructure. So studying mailing lists in qualitative and quantitative manner is one way of doing so. And that's why we of course open sourced the tool and uh, made, it, made the code very much visible, just like we try to invert the, uh, uh, the infrastructure of the internet itself so students at the same time learn how to engage with the data as well as uh, the, uh, use the, uh, the bare bones of statistics, et cetera. So this allows us to teach how qualitative and quantitative analysis goes together. And if you would like to have a try, please do so and have a look at dataactive.github.io and try the tool and try to do some analysis on IETF, ICANN and write mailing lists going back for decades. And please let us know how we can make it better and uh, whether you enjoyed the chapter. Thanks so much. Thanks, Niels. And remember to share the link in the chat so people can go and look at it. Ron. Hi, Henriette, great to see you. And, and uh, I'm honored to be uh, among the colleagues here and to contribute to this uh, really excellent volume. Uh, my chapter is on information security and specifically uh, research on information security. I wanted to look at the way in which uh, biases or external factors shape the information security research agenda. Uh, so my chapter is very much a kind of STS uh, study of the social construction of the information security field. In other words, what gets counted as a legitimate problem of inquiry and, and what gets excluded or what doesn't count. So I'm looking at ep epistemological and methodological questions about the constitution of the field of information security research as, a, as it exists today in academia. And a lot of the, the um, chapter is based on the direct experiences of the Citizen Lab, which is the center I direct at the, at the University of Toronto. We do interdisciplinary research on digital security issues that arise out of human rights concerns. Uh, we lift the lid on, on um, activities that are going on beneath the surface that many powerful actors, both states and corporations, would rather we did not. So we've been sued, we've been threatened with lawsuits, uh, we've been harassed, stalked, and hacked by private intelligence agencies and by states. Um, so I feel like uh, this is very close to home for me. Um, among the biggest concerns I outline in the chapter are the influences of the private sector as gatekeepers on information security research, including controlling who gets access to data that is important to information security research. And I'm also concerned about the influence of national security agencies, especially the growth of classified research, research that um, research centers that are, that are proliferating, uh, that have been seeded or sponsored by intelligence agencies that involve a form of closed, secretive, or otherwise proprietary, proprietary research. Um, I make several recommendations at the end of the chapter. First is to encourage more interdisciplinarity. Uh, interdisciplinary research is talked about a lot, is very rarely practiced. Um, I think we need to break down those disciplinary silos. Uh, I, second, I say controversial methods will need protection, maybe even new legal protection. Thinking in particular about reverse engineering, 
which covers a wide range of techniques and, and tools um, that is under threat today. And, and third, openness is critical. Um, the type of proprietary secretive research that we see proliferating is antithetical to the openness of the university's mission. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Ron. And thanks everyone for really um, profound comment. I'm, I, I know everyone can't see it, but we have um, around 150 plus participants. So um, um, I think your comments are reaching relevant ears. Finally, we are going to listen to Jeanette and Nanette. Um, and I'll introduce them then briefly. Um, Nanette, Dr. Nanette S. Levinson is associate, associate Dean of Faculty of Affairs in the School of International Service at American University. Jeanette Hoffman is a political scientist and she's professor of internet politics at the Free University of Berlin. And she conducts research at the Social Science Center um, Berlin on topics such as global governance, regulation of the internet and transformation of copyright. So um, Jeanette and Nanette, your, your question is kind of the, the, the other side of the mirror of the question that, that the first group that Laura, Sandra and Milton responded to. Um, how can we make sense of internet governance and its concepts, the existing ones and the emerging ones, like multi-stakeholder stakeholderism, for example, as the field moves forward and evolves? Um, let's start with you, Jeanette. Thank you, Henriette. Um, hi, all. Um, and thank you for including me and my work into this really important new volume. So what is my chapter about? Um, I look at um, the concept of multi-stakeholderism, which is today um, a characteristic element of internet governance. And it starts from the observation that there is a striking gap between multi-stakeholderism as an international research field, which looks at many areas, not only internet governance, and multi-stakeholderism as a practice. As a general rule, I would say that academic research is much more skeptical about the capacity or performance of multi-stakeholderism than practitioners. One could also say that there is a considerable discrepancy between expectations and performance. My article addresses this discrepancy by looking at what could be called the world making power of discourses, narratives and imaginaries. Discourses are today defined as knowledge orders consisting of ensembles of ideas, concepts, and categorizations. That's how uh, Martin Heyer defines discourses. And imaginaries are defined as collective beliefs about how society functions. That's how Sheila Jasanoff looks at this. So narratives can be regarded as essential elements of meaning making that to some extent structure policy making. Without a common understanding of what is at stake and what needs to be done, collaborative policy making would be clearly impossible. And my uh, ch uh, chapter suggests to, uh, regarding meaning making as a powerful part of the policy process because it, it, forms, it informs expectations, identification and policy goals, and of course, conflicts about them. For this reason, internet governance research should include into the analysis the stories that internet governance actors produce about this field and its development. And my uh, chapter suggests discourse analysis as a way of studying internet governance narratives of fictions. And it demonstrates the analytical benefit of doing so by studying the impact of the multi-stakeholder narrative on the actual behavior and orientation of actors in the field. 
So it shows the organizing potential of narratives with regard to ICANN and the IGF. Oops, too long. Sorry. Thanks, thanks, Jeanette. Perfect. Um, Nanette. Thank you, Henriette. And I'd also like to thank Jeanette and every one of our authors. You actually all set the scene in your remarks today and also in your vibrantly written chapters, the state of our field, 2020, 2021. And I think the chapters together, as I point out in my final chapter, present a vast array of actors and especially the key role of technology and technical infrastructure as an actor, interacting or not at multiple and messy governance levels. And also, the amazing array of approaches, very vibrant approaches that we heard today and are exemplified in our chapters, whether disciplinary or analytic or methodological. This sets the scene for a discussion of gaps and opportunities in my final chapter. And I just wanna highlight here a couple of gaps and a couple of opportunities. First, for gaps. Although we have several chapters that take brilliant longitudinal views in my view, I really think we need more longitudinal research in our field. I also note for the most part, an absence of work that looks at what can be called governance learning or network learning, or even policy learning studies. And finally, I think there's a gap in terms of a need for more work with a focus on gender and on culture in its myriad dimensions. And now to gaps, just a few again. I mean to opportunities, just a few again. Um, first, quickly, there is very little dialogue across cross global governance research areas, such as environmental governance or health governance. There is tremendous opportunity, I talk about this in the chapter, for increased dialogue across those global governance areas. Okay. Secondly, there's an opportunity for nuanced, nonlinear, and innovative approaches to our work, some of which have already been highlighted today. Here, I highlight the use of possible experimental methods and also the use of indigenous research methods, helpful also in looking at collaborative processes. Finally, my chapter ends with a couple of considerations. I'll mention one in closing. And that is, in this time of pandemic and crisis, there's a need for work on societal dynamic resilience. Very few people are looking at this work in terms of the field of internet governance. And with a salute to the early creators of our internet who focused on resilience, I think there is tremendous opportunity and that this work should be considered in future research for our field. So I thank all of our authors for spurring these ideas and I turn it back to you, Henriette. Thanks, Nanette. And I know the authors are very grateful to the editors as well. Um, and thanks for those remarks. I think your, your input resonates with what Ron said about um, the rarity of real multidisciplinary work. And, and I can, as an internet governance practitioner, I can say we, we, we struggle with the same concern. We, we need to be more uh, multidisciplinary breakdown silos, but even um, at the level of, of, act, of practitioners, that doesn't happen enough. Now, authors, your final question. Um, what is your greatest fear and or hope for internet governance? You don't have to answer um, and you don't have to give a fear and a hope. You can give just one. Um, there's space for pes pessimism in, 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 our, in our universe. I'm just gonna call your name. Um, otherwise this will be chaos and then you can respond. And we'll try and do this quickly. You've got 30 seconds each. Ron, I'm starting with you. Oh, wow. Well, I, my biggest fear is that all of this uh, fascinating uh, set of discussions we're having will be moot given climate change and, and the looming extinction of, of human society as we know it. Sandra. I'll second Ron, but before we get there, speaking as an American citizen on September 22, 2020, my biggest fear is totalitarianism. Wendy. Uh, my biggest fear 
and it's also my my biggest fear is that the technical standards that are, the, the open and technical standards that came from the founders of the internet are broken and my greatest hope is that they're not broken thanks thanks for that um milton well, my biggest fear is playing out before our very eyes that the, the nation states will begin to fragment or align the internet with their boundaries and erect uh, some kind of a recreation of the PTT monopolies of the 20th century. My biggest hope is that that won't happen, <laughs> that we can stop oh. it. Rolf, are you ready? Well, uh, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as a, as a member of the older generation, I'm uh, rather optimistic. I think we have never seen in history so much involvement of a large part of civil uh, society contributing to policymaking processes. We do have more possibilities in uh, coordinate cross-border activities. I also trust in the capability of civil society to respectfully influence mm -hmm. the governing bodies in responsibly making the internet infrastructure fruitful for everybody within a transparent and accountable, accountable regulatory framework. Jeanette. So my greatest fear is that what started as emancipatory uh, technology, the internet, that it now turns increasingly into tools of suppression. And my hope is that this is just a period and not a uh, long-term linear process. Nils. I'm very excited about the reconfiguration of the internet infrastructure and its, uh, and its governance to further decolonize uh, the infrastructure and in this new form, take human rights considerations into account in the development. Ricky. Yes, so um, my greatest hope is that we reclaim data and data use for individual empowerment, for research and for the public good. And my fear is that we don't get it right <laughs> and we lose out on that. Eric. Uh, biggest fear is snakes. Uh, they freak me out. Um, biggest fear with regards to the internet is definitely the idea that uh, it's more or less a giant preferential attachment machine that just produces massive inequalities and that this is going to continue and get worse over time rather than get better. And finally, well, no, no, we're not finally yet. We have a few. Francesca, you are next. So this is both a hope and a fear is uh, what we will be doing with uh, what is now the world's most discreet and pervasive entity and uh, who will be behind that we, which might turn hope into fear and vice versa. <laughs> um, and next we have Nanette. Yes, to match these very real fears and very important and compelling fears, my greatest hope is for increased inclusivity, innovation, and ethical improvisation in our field and in practice. Derek. Um, my biggest fear is that all of the progress that's been made uh, over the last two decades uh, for integrating civil society and transnational participants into global governance um, starts, continues to be challenged and those opportunities get um, lockdown and all of the knowledge and the resources and the ideas of these wonderful actors gets excluded. Uh, my hope is that it doesn't and that the technologies that we have can enable people to participate from wherever they are in the world. Um, this has been highlighted by this period of the pandemic and I think uh, that gives us reason for hope. Thanks, thanks for that Derek and Laura you have the last word. I'm so relieved that no one has decided that blockchain is the, is the great hope for internet governance. Um, the internet has leapt already from the digital world into the biological world and the physical world. 
my great hope for internet governance is that it also leaps from 2D into 3D as a way to help solve some of the human rights problems, the environmental problems, and other uh, major issues of our time. Well, thanks very much, um, everyone, for being so concise and disciplined. And this gives us um, space to, to look at our, our Q&A. And to get us started, I see a question here from Fiona Alexander, um, which I will read. And then you can think about who's going to take this. Fiona asks, um, well, she says that internet governance processes allow for the full participation of stakeholders, including the academic community. Um, do you think this hinders or helps the researching of internet governance? And how do you maintain your neutrality or independence as a researcher of internet governance while also being an active participant or an advocate for particular positions or approaches in internet governance? So I think a very pertinent question, particularly considering how many of our authors are also often active participants in internet governance. Who wants to respond to that? I'd, I'd like to take a crack at it, Henriette. So I think Fiona is, is right. And, and we've seen Fiona you know, so many times in her previous life um, at these uh, events as well. So it's a, it's a wonderful question to ask. Um, and it is true that these multi-stakeholder processes allow academics to participate actively. And I think that has been um, uh, a real advantage to these processes, having being such an open process and allowing academics to participate uh, actively. Uh, there are two ways to participate, however. You can participate as an observer, or you can participate as a participant observer. Um, and within our group of academics who participate in the process in this way, there tends to be a, a split and a balance between those who um, see themselves as very, very active and engaged and are shaping and participating in the processes and those who are participating, but more so as observers. And from a methodological perspective, it would be observers versus participant observers. Both of those types of academics uh, benefit the study of internet governance because it deepens the knowledge and expertise and engagement on both the substantive level and the ability to collect um, and, uh, and, and analyze uh, research. Uh, we formed something called GIGANET, um, the Global Internet Governance Academic Network that many of us are members of. Many of the founding members are here, uh, going back to uh, Dresden, uh, uh, Germany, and the castle that we hung out in, Milton. Um, and so uh, GIGANET has academics of both types um, and we, we work together. Um, we don't necessarily form an epistemic community, which we could, um, where um, we would all share a similar global paradigm, but we, dis we differ, we debate uh, around how we see um, the world. So um, it is possible, Fiona, to both be engaged and be an active advocate, and it's also possible to be engaged in the process and try to maintain a level of uh, neutrality, even though some people disagree with that. I'd well, like to jump in too, if I could. Uh, Go ahead, Milton. Um, so one of the things I think we have to point out is that this is not unique to internet governance. Um, mm -hmm. Any kind of uh, social science research that involves public policy, government, politics uh, has the same issue. And uh, you know, I don't think I need to remind everybody that uh, <clears throat> the amount of money that comes from the government for funding research on um, social issues and social problems, and uh, there's no sort of neutrality possible there. Uh, but you can, as, as Derek suggests, distinguish between your role as a participant and your role as an analyst. Uh, you can't do the same thing at the same time, or you can't do them both at the same time, but you can uh, do that. And I think the point uh, that Derek made that I want to emphasize is that by participating, you actually become a better uh, scientist in the sense that you become aware of real problems in the social sphere, the real conflicts. And if you are not participating, you really don't understand what's going on, no matter how much scientific method you use. Thanks, Milton. I would just, you know, respond to Fiona's question, turning it around a little bit and just say that as a non-academic, 
who is actively involved in internet governance. I find the participation of academics absolutely indispensable. I really, I think it adds enormous value to, to multi-stakeholder internet governance processes. So no matter how challenging it is for you as scholars, um, please don't stop participating. Um, next, we have a question um, from Larry Strickling. Um, I'll read it out and um, great to have you here with us, Larry and Fiona and, and everyone else. Larry asks, what has happened to the prospects for multi-stakeholder internet governance in the last four years? With the US largely missing in action, um, and I think you're referring here to the US government, is there still a vocal constituency to utilize and expand use of these multi-stakeholder internet governance methods? Who wants to respond to Larry? Laura. I got voluntold, Larry, to, to contribute. Um, I think it's a really essential question, um, but I, I would say that um, multi-stakeholder internet governance is still alive, even though there has been a pushback and a pullback from the US government in a variety of, way, of ways from international discussions. But if you think about multi-stakeholder governance being private sector led, multi-stakeholder governance. I think that that is alive and well. We see, um, if anything, an increase in power of private ordering. Um, we also see a lot of uh, global institutions that still have a, a great deal of power in establishing the technical design, especially in cybersecurity governance, in standard setting, in the internet of things. So I would say, even though there has been a balance of power shift, that not only multi-stakeholder internet governance that's led by the private sector, but involves traditional governments and new institutions, not only is that alive and well, but I, I would also say that multi-stakeholder uh, research is uh, something that's on the rise where you see collaborations between uh, people from different sectors. And thank you, Henriette, for joining us today for this. Um, would anyone else like to add to that? Such an important question. I'd like to jump in just quickly if I could. So, so I think I love the way that Henriette sort of framed the question uh, right at the beginning when she said she, she's assuming Larry's talking about the US government because in these global governance processes, um, one of the things that is, is possible is looking at states at subnational levels. And so because civil society can participate and use these kinds of tools to participate, civil society has been continuing to participate very actively. And I think if you look back over the period of uh, civil society advocates uh, from academics and others participating, it started early on with very simple tools to be able to collaborate. So email listservs, as Niels was saying. But now that we have tools like, and we had them for a long time, but web conferencing and other kinds of collaborative tools, it makes it much easier for civil society to engage in these processes. And, and I think that it gives a, a tremendous boost to these types of actors. I just have a, a very quick, if I could, just to add and echo Laura and Derek's comments, just with a piece of data that I know we're all aware of the new digital roadmap or roadmap for digital cooperation at the United Nations. And they have within that um, emphasized um, a multi-stakeholder approach, although um, we do see um, a, a greater role for private sector and still challenges um, in terms of including civil society voices in some of the United Nations fora, but there's still hope. Um, thanks for adding that. And I would just add to that, that I think that, I mean, our, our starting point should be both as practitioners and as scholars is that, that, that the whole concept of multi-stakeholder internet governance and what it means is not uncontested. And I think that, that, that if we keep that in mind, Larry, the response to your question is, this is kind of powerful, the course in a way. I think we must expect this, it will happen. It will come from different sources at different times. And, but next we have a question, which I think uh, builds very well on Larry's question. And that's from Gangesh Varma, um, who, who says, um, well, he expresses um, a lot of appreciation, a lot of appreciation for participation of stakeholders. While the older debate was about getting a seat at the table, now there is focus on your voice being heard 
and an equally current yet future-oriented question is around meaningful participation. How do you think questions around power structures, independence, co-optation or co-opting of stakeholders, and so on, will unravel in multi-stakeholder internet governance in the future? Who's going to take on that question? I'm happy to, uh, uh, to have Sandra a Sandra and Nils and Jeanette. Um, Nils, you go first. I see Laura, you as well. We have time, so please go ahead. Just everyone be brief. Nils, you go first. I would argue we first need to look at what meaningful multi-stakeholder governance would look like. For instance, in the IETF, we see a very North American, Western Europe dominated uh, and very male, very white uh, 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 population. And when civil society tries to intervene, they are often only accepted there to legitimize the particular governance ordering and not to have actual influence. And this is even being said explicitly so. So I do not, I, I'm, I'm also very afraid that we as researchers, when we mainstream the concept of multi-stakeholder governance, which I think Jeanette really nicely brings home in her chapter, we shouldn't legitimize this ordering where we actually do not have uh, uh, power and it just serves to uh, legitimize a certain kind of control of particular actors. Thanks, Nils. Sandra, you wanted to add. Yes, that was a beautifully shaped question. Thank you very much. Um, it's a question about what is the nature of power in this environment. Um, political scientists for a long time have talked about power in instrumental forms. You're affecting the physical world, structural forms, the design of organizations and rules, symbolic or soft power. And, and the big issue now and for several decades has been informational power, which includes control over the informational bases of power in its instrumental, structural, and symbolic forms, as well as new tools of power that never were before available. All of that theoretical background um, uh, to say that there's that something that links together things that several of the authors said today, I think the key going forward is, uh, is, is control over informational power rather than structural or symbolic. That is the informational bases of our decision making, which have become so uh, uncertain uh, and increasingly deliberately uh, perturbed or uh, malformed altogether. So that um, that was the subject of discussion by Wendy Hall. It was the subject of discussion by Ricky Jurgensen. Um, it ran through many of the papers here, but that's what I see as, the, as where the future contest is. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. Um, Jeanette and Laura, you also wanted to respond to this. Is it me first? Because you mentioned me first? Yes, go okay. ahead. Um, what I really like about this question is this list of um, sort of expressions about sort of multi-stakeholder practice, which shows some form of desperation. It starts with the seed, then it's a voice, and then it's about meaningful participation. And I think this sort of changing expressions reflect the fact that there is always a tendency that political innovations become somewhat ceremonial. We see the same um, aspect actually in uh, gender equality where it all boils down to having a number of women at the table, no matter what they say or whether they ever have a chance to say something meaningful. And I think that is a, a, um, a tendency that we also see in internet governance, that it sort of boils down to have the African person and the Asian woman and sort of trying to represent the unrepresentable. And I'm a bit desperate about how to actually counter this. And that now comes back to um, Fiona's question of how do we sort of actually make sure that as researchers, as observers, we do not sort of uh, walk into this trap of buying into concepts that have become shallow and ceremonial. So it's really important when you participate in such processes to learn methodologically, to detach yourself from that kind of buzzword language and be critical and sober about it. Laura. I was really just nodding my head uh, so that Jeanette would uh, weigh in on that, and I'm glad she did. But since you called on me, I think um, you know one thing that's really, really critical 
is that oftentimes when people are discussing multi-stakeholder governance, they really are talking about the content level and the discussions about internet governance. And as has always been the case, the power behind internet governance is what's happening in the technical architecture, in the arrangements of technology and in the decisions by the private sector. So it's really important to remember that, that it's not so much you know, how multi-stakeholder is a discussion, such as at the internet governance forum, which is very valuable, but it's about who has the actual power while those discussions are taking place. Thanks, thanks, Laura. Next, um, and I see there's some comments as well, and I hope everyone can follow the Q&A. There was an interesting comment uh, from Maria Michaels, just reminding us also that civil society is not only made up of progressive civil society stakeholders. And I think that applies to all stakeholder groups, actually, and to all actors. And, and which is why this, this one dimensional approach that Jeanette criticized um, is so flawed. But now we have a very practical question from Grace Abuhamad. Very nice to have you here, Grace. What success or failures have you seen in applying internet governance best practices into emerging fields such as artificial intelligence policy? Who wants to respond? Milton. I can't see everyone's hands, but others, please don't feel shy to speak up. But so Milton and Wendy. Yeah, I think um, the field uh, has kind of fetishized uh, multi-stakeholderism <clears throat> to the point where uh, we've lost sight of why it emerged the way it did and, and what it really is. So, so we got multi-stakeholder approaches in ICANN because we didn't want uh, nation states to control the domain name system but ICANN still has real power over the domain name industry in the form of contracts that allow it to enter the business and, and regulate its activities. So what other kinds of um, situations do uh, would a non-governmental multi-stakeholder governance institution have that kind of authority or the ability to exercise that kind of authority? That's the question you have to ask. So when it comes to things like national security and military power, it's very unlikely that we're going to get multi-stakeholder forms of governance. When it comes to AI, again, you're probably looking at a situation where uh, you can set up industry cooperative uh, or possibly cooperation among civil society, such as we're sort of setting up with respect to content moderation, but, um, you're really not going to have uh, the kind of direct multi-stakeholder authority over algorithms and the design of software. And it's not clear to me that you should have that, uh, that that would lead to good results. Um, you really are going to have to rely on a combination of market forces and traditional government uh, regulation at the national level if you want to crack open certain forms of data practices. Um, thanks, Milton. And I see that Wendy and Sandra also wants to comment on this. Um, and Annette, I, I'm not sure if your hand was also up, but Wendy, you go first. Thank you very much. Um, I have a lot to do with AI policy in the UK. And um, you, I find it very hard to, different, to, to se separate that from data governance policy. And, and internet governance for me is, is, is very um, related to that. And so I, I think it's absolutely, I can't see the question now, but the question was, how does it feed into AI policy? I think it's so important. You see what I was talking about earlier is the way the different parts of the world and, and Milton's talk about this as well and others, uh, the different regions of the world are framing their data governance policies um, in order, um, and you see that with Europe, with data protection regulation, um, they are now about to produce some papers about how that will help them frame their AI policy. And um, it's, it's um, uh, my worry about that is that they'll regulate before they understand what needs to be regulated. But on the other hand, their aims are very laudable. Um, but uh, the, the other, uh, you know, so I, I, I really think it's a very important question. There's no, there's no easy answers, but 
it's it's absolutely what we're talking about here feeds directly into um, AI policies. And I just would like to take the as I've got the floor another. Um, I was going to say something earlier when you talk about multi stakeholdership and other things is that the elephant in the room is always China. You mentioned about America coming out of the game Well, China, of course, is coming into the game and that I don't you know, there are opportunities there as well as threats. Um, and they do, they are interested in this debate. I took part in a workshop on Sunday talking about citizenship in a network age, jointly with the law school at Tsinghua University. And so, um, you know, whilst they have, issue, they have a government that, does, you know, has its way of governing things, they still, there's still a huge amount of, of interest and desire to, um, to, to be able to discuss these issues. And, and, I, and I think it's really important. There's a global partnership on AI emerging and it has every country under the sun except China. And it's, uh, so that's 20% of the world not included in that discussion. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. So um, I think we have to embrace our, the things we can agree on as well as understanding there are some fundamental differences in the way we are governed. And, and Sandra, you wanted to add. You're on mute. Sandra, I think you muted. Yes. Okay, um, again, um, another excellent question. Um, I think it really draws us to what are some of the theoretical and methodological challenges that face those of us in internet governance and those of us who study governance uh, altogether. I, to take off to go uh, from Francesca Musiani's insights regarding the technical, the socio-technical nature of our systems, we now know that uh, internet governance has changed the nature of, of even formal state government governance. Um, and so we have a wide, at this point, we have a wide range of different kinds of institutions, all of which are involved in governance processes, but that have different relationship, different kinds of relationships to the, to the technical side and to the social side. Um, so when we think about socio-technical problems on the theoretical side, we've now gotten the big points down. Um, anyone who does socio-technical analysis now faces the next step of working out how different governance environments are different and how they would then differentially engage with both the social and the technical and how those two can uh, be brought into the same conversation so that both sides of our needs are uh, developed. Uh, this is an area in which Niels uh, Tenova and I are currently working, um, trying to work, move forward both theoretically and to develop research indicators to allow us to compare and contrast, which would then provide the answers to this question being asked about uh, multi-stakeholder governance in different environments. Um, thanks for that. Um, Everyone, um, panelists, authors, and participants, just a time check, we've got seven minutes left. So I'm gonna take two more questions um, and ask my authors to be brief. The first one is from Linda Janssen. Um, Ron Diebert did touch on this to some extent in, in, his, in his input earlier, but she asks, since large amounts of data needed for research are currently controlled by private companies instead of the government, are you concerned that these private companies have too much control over access? For example, social media companies may provide or withhold access to certain data or may or may not allow repeat access to the same data set for replicating the study. So um, Francesca and Ron, um, can you respond to that? Um, starting with Ron and then Francesca. Sure, thank, thank you, Anurat, and thank you, Linda, for the question. The, the short answer is yes, very much so. I think this is a, a huge problem and we're just at the cusp of it. You know, we live our lives in, in, in a public sphere that's mediated and controlled by these large tech platforms. So much of what we want to study about social life exists as data uh, that is proprietary to these companies' platforms. And they're not always uh, obviously very open about who has access. And, you know, there've been some notable experiments to try to craft some kind of entry point for researchers, but those have mostly fallen significantly short of what would be uh, useful. So I think moving forward, we'd want to advocate that there be specific laws that require access, uh, you know, really to get into the 
to the algorithms, especially and, and further research on algorithmic accountability, you need to get inside the platforms. And I think that is a legal matter. Francesca. Yes, I just wanted to make a really short addition to this, um, thinking about uh, web archives as well, because what is true for like figuring out how to access to uh, how to access platforms and platform data in the future also applies to some extent to making available uh, the web of the past. And this is why actually web archiving is one area of internet governance that has uh, like reproduced in its microcosm almost all of the traditional questions of internet governance, starting with uh, the need for uh, a lot of different people to be at the table. Otherwise, we'll have the Googles and Facebooks uh, uh, reconstructing their own version of the web of the past and making that available. And maybe this is not something we want, or at least not this, the only thing we want. <laughs> And um, thanks, Francesca. And Eric, you wanted to add something to this. And Jeanette, I see you as well, but you had you have to all be very quick. So Eric, you go first. Yeah, thanks. I just I I, I would second what has just been said. Um, says in in specific areas in particular, I think the the stakes are so high that uh, data access is immensely important. And the way I sort of look at it all, just very briefly, is it boils down to sort of like the political economy, the surrounding numbers and, um, and data. And I remember in one instance, pouring through a cybersecurity vendor report, all of their figures were going the same direction. And then they're trying to sell a product. And there was one trend that was going, that was actually improving rather than worsening. And they flipped the scale so that the bars still went up, but actually an up bar meant a positive. But if you were reading it fast, you wouldn't notice. So there's subtle tricks like this that if you don't know have the data underlying it, it can be really hard to get at. And I just returned to my, the point of my chapter, this notion that if you don't have a good descriptive basis for reality, it's hard to do everything. Uh, and so uh, I would second the idea we need as much as we can transparent access to data. And Derek, you also wanted to weigh in on this question. Sure, just very quickly. So, uh, of course, we're concerned about the uh, aggregation and monopoly of data by the private sector. But uh, Milton and I were answering some of the questions uh, on the on, on the online format. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of data that is available, and I think you know we should be thrilled that uh, through. Uh, uh, APIs and being able to access uh, data from companies via APIs uh, through web scraping uh, and a variety of other tools we, and, and open, open data initiatives by governments around the world, there's a tremendous amount of data that is available. Um, as the social media data does get locked down further uh, and the APIs change, it's a move towards trying to protect privacy and um, to recognize what's happened with some of the horrible you know, the Cambridge Analytic, uh, Analytica and so forth. So um, overall, I think there's, there's a tremendous access to data that's still available. So there's more data available, there's more access to it, but the power and control around that data remains um, problematic. So um, our final question, um, and I'm sorry if, I, if I'm cutting anyone off, I'm just doing a time check. Um, there's a question that was asked by Dia Basso. Um, and Dia says, the global South is largely seen as the new big internet markets and internet governance policy making seems to follow the old developmental model, which I assume you mean sort of global North um, sets the paradigm and, and, and has most of the control and influence. And then Dia asks, do you see any move towards a more participatory model between the global north and global south. Who wants to respond to, to this challenging question? Wendy. Wendy and then Milton and Sandra. Yeah, just a quick, um, my worry about the, for the global south is how much China is, I'm sorry, it's China again, China's investing in internet technologies. Um, and so um, by default, um, some of the governments in those areas are beholden to China to uh, be able to deliver the internet to their citizens and that, you know, we're not doing anything to help them. Sandra. You muted. <laughs> Sandra, just unmute your mic. 
at I least know, I'm consistent. Um, this is not a direct answer to the question, but it's a thought, it's an example of a meta question that it raises, just as I would argue that under the pandemic experience, we've seen the end of globalization, um, even down to the loss of cosmopolitanism as everybody pods up in their little spaces of people who think the same thing they do. Um, that uh, we might think about the needs of the global south as distributed throughout all societies now, in which case it might be uh, it might be that it's the hackers to whom we turn um, as key player as key uh, players in the nature of governance as they provoke and develop alternative ways of doing things. Just a provocative thought. Yeah, I want to. Milton, the key to this question. So. What has happened with China? It has become essentially a peer of the United States, particularly in terms of the internet economy. And how has the United States reacted? It has reacted with fear, with, uh, with uh, division, and uh, with confrontation. And frankly, that's what you can expect if any other uh, currently developing country uh, reaches a point at which it is a military and economic rival of the current uh, dominating uh, powers. Um, and I think what we have to learn is that the, the global South, if it continues to develop, uh, which I believe it will, as long as it uh, adheres to a market economy paradigm, uh, when they grow and become bigger, they will get more participation, they will have more influence, they will start to to define standards. They will become standards makers as well as standards takers. They will start to dominate uh, the governance institutions simply because there's more people there than there are in the United States. And um, uh, we have to learn how to, to deal with that without uh, getting into military and geopolitical confrontation. That is one of the key internet governance issues of the, of the current period. Um, thanks for that. And I, I think I would just add in response to Dia's question and that I agree completely with both Milton and Sandra, but I don't think that means we're developing more participatory models. I think we're still a long way from, from, from more participatory models between the global uh, north and the global south. And also who's they? I think it's also, you know, we need to identify which global south it is that, that we are talking about. But I think it does remain challenging. But Sandra, I think your idea is really interesting, actually. So on that note, I'm afraid that I have to bring this uh, book launch to a close. Um, I want to thank the authors enormously and the editors and the, the support team at American University at the Internet Governance Lab who helped with this. And to everyone who's joined the session, I'm very sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, please do continue, follow the link in the chat and continue asking um, questions um, online. So thanks very much, everyone. I'm not sure if the editors want to have the last word. Uh, I just want to say, cool. Henriette, uh, on behalf of my co-editors, we thank you so much for taking on this challenging role of managing an hour and a half globally distributed session. So thank you so much. You did a marvelous job. Thank you. You're much easier than the multi-stakeholder advisory group of the Internet Governance Forum. And, and many of them are online. So I hope they forgive me of, uh, forgive me for saying that. Thanks, thanks very much, everyone, and have a good rest of day wherever you are.